Good morning. It's Thursday, the 24th of August, and this is Govind Raj Ethiraj, based in Mumbai, India's financial capital, and in transit right now. Our top stories and themes for the day: Qatar Investment Authority is to invest 8,278 crore rupees in Reliance Retail. Indian markets are overvalued, say some analysts, by how much? With Ambarish Baliga. Remittances out of India are up 50% in the last quarter to 6.1 billion dollars. Foreign direct investment, on the other hand, into India is slowing down. India is seeing record power demand, and India achieves a successful moon landing. This is a core report with Govind Raj Ethiraj. Reliance Retail Ventures said today that Qatar Investment Authority is to invest 8278 crores into Reliance Retail a subsidiary of Reliance Industries valuing the company around 100 billion dollars or a pre-money equity value of 8.27 lakh crore rupees the deal and the contours of this were first reported by the Financial Times London a month ago in the context of oil rich gulf funds increasing their bets on the indian market Reliance Retail claims roughly 267 million loyalty customers with an integrated omni-channel network of about 18,500 stores and digital commerce platforms across grocery, consumer electronics, fashion, lifestyle and pharma consumption. QIA's investment will translate into a minority equity stake of 0.99 or less than 1% in Reliance Retail on a fully diluted basis. Reliance Retail for those of you who might remember raised about 47000 crores in 2020 at a pre-money equity value of about 4.21 lakh crore or roughly half the valuation that we are seeing today. The last raises were at the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic all of which of course appears quite distant now. Isha Ambani director of Reliance Retail said the investment by QIA is a strong endorsement of a positive outlook towards the Indian economy and Reliance Retail's business model strategy and execution capabilities. Mansoor Ibrahim Al Mahmood CEO of QIA said that QIA was committed to supporting innovative companies with high growth potential in India's fast growing retail market. QIA invests in a diverse range of businesses and has a asset under management base of about 450 billion dollars. In the last 6 months its investments have ranged from sports and entertainment franchise companies to electric battery makers to biotech electronics and marketing platforms. Earlier QIA acquired a stake in Adani Green Energy totaling about 2.5% and investing about 500 million dollars according to news reports. Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, Cyril Amarchand Mangaldas and Davis Polk and Wardwell acted as advisors and legal counsels to the transaction. AZB and Clary Gottlieb acted as legal counsel to QIA. Elsewhere in the Reliance Group the Geo Financial stock got pounded again to the 5% lower circuit on Wednesday making it the third day in succession more of that in a moment meanwhile the Sensex itself closed 213 points higher at 65433 and the Nifty ended at 19444 up 48 points the market's clearly seem to be in a plateau of sorts right now and for various reasons while the long term bullishness seems intact the short term seems a little hazy To understand how and why the markets were well range bound right now and seemingly directionless I reached out to Ambarish Baliga veteran market analyst and began by asking him why the stock markets were in this current holding pattern See because most of the triggers are done I think earnings season was a trigger for the markets and that's done already and now you have the inflation issue which are coming up we have a china economic slowdown and possible downgrade I think that will have a fall out on other countries including India because of which i am a bit cautious on the markets at this point of time technically the markets are holding up no doubt i think 19200 is a very important for the support and in case we break that i think we could see a decent fall which would take the markets to possibly 8500 levels or below i think that's when the markets again become decently priced but at this point of time i would say markets are a tad bit expensive And you know we saw a lot of flows coming in earlier from both foreign investors as well as domestic investors domestic seems to be continuing whereas foreign investors have obviously slowed down so how do you see that trend affecting the market and how do you see it going forward I uh, see that FIs have been investing decently well in the past couple of months but then lately they have been net sellers but then that's well supported by the sort of flows which have been coming into uh, mutual funds 
SIP flows have seen record highs and mutual funds cannot really sit on cash because of which that investment has been coming in and that's going to support under the FI selling. And on a fundamental side, how is your view now for the next six months, given where we were three months ago, quite literally? Fundamentally, I'm finding the markets a tad bit expensive. And if you notice the mid cap and the small caps, I mean, the way they have moved in the past couple of months, some of them have actually become multi-baggers. I mean, even their valuations are very, very expensive. I mean, I wouldn't be a buyer at this point of time unless I see a very decent direction. When you say fundamentals, you're referring to price. What I was referring to is more the performance of companies and margins and bottom lines and so on. See, the performance has improved, no doubt, and especially on the budget overall at a very broad level. The revenue increase hasn't been what we were expecting. But then now we have seen the margins improving. That's because for most of the industry, the input costs have come down compared to what we had seen in the last 12 months. That has helped in improving margins. But then I don't see the margins shooting up too much further, at least in the foreseeable two to three quarters. Right. And we've all been looking at the geo financial stock, which was valued at 20 billion in the discovery trading session and now has been continuously falling. And this is the third day it has fallen. Why is this happening? See, first of all, geo financial was supposed to get out of the Sensex and the FT within three days. Now they have extended that to early next week. And we have a number of passive funds holding geo financial because they were holding Reliance Industries and that's how they got allotted to geo financial. And they need to exit the stock because if it's not there in the entices, which they track, they can't have them in the portfolio. So they still have those other three days to exit the stock. I think this is what created that supply pressure. And on the day of the listing, it was expected that it would be a big bank listing. Possibly the stock can go to levels of 300 or more. So what happened on day one was quite contrary to the expectations. And I think this created some amount of panic even among the retail and the HNI allottees of Geo Financial. So I think overall selling pressure continues. And it's very much possible that we could see levels of 200 or 210 for the stock before it consolidates. Because we should remember that 28th is the HGM of Reliance Industries. And normally, I mean, uh, in an AGM, we don't discuss about an associate company or a group company. But I think Reliance AGM is different. And surely there'll be some talk on the road ahead for Geo Financial. And I think that is what will possibly provide support for the stock. Right. And so you're saying market is essentially waiting to see what the direction is because at this point, the company really does not have any business. Absolutely. Because it's quite difficult to value a stock like Geo Financial. I mean, it's basically sentiment driven. When I talk of sentiments, we look back over the last two decades as to which are the new businesses which uh, Vocation Ambani Reliance has got it to. And that's your geo telecom as well as retail. And both of them have been disruptors in that market. And they've become leaders by far. And the sort of reach and data which you have with this sort of ammunition, that is what is expected out of uh, geo financial and because of which I mean, this sort of valuation is being given. Ambarish, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Speaking of investments, while some foreign direct investment is coming in, like the Reliance deal we just spoke of, and more on FDI in a moment, flow of funds from individuals out of the country is only increasing. Outward remittances under the government's liberalized remittance scheme, which of course is set to become less liberal in coming months, was up 50% to about $9.1 billion in the April to June quarter of 23-24 or the current financial year. Now, this was mostly driven by investments in equity and debt instruments, purchase of immovable properties, deposits and international travel. For last year, for all of this, the figure was about $6 billion. The gift segment rose to about $1.3 billion from $770 million and maintenance of close relatives was up to $1.8 billion. That's up 78%. The Business Standard reports that purchase of immovable property saw a 122% jump to around $90 million. Equity and debt almost doubled to $503 million from $223 million and deposits overseas were also up 62% to $430 million. Now here's the interesting one. International travel went up to $4 billion. That's up about 39% from $2.9 billion last year. So obviously, many of us are not just traveling more than before, but are also spending more than before. 
A new tax collected at source regime with higher tax deductions, all by refundable later, is set to kick in on October 1st and many Indians are believed to be using this window as much as possible. The study's overseas category was the only one that was down at this point, around 6% annually to about 694 million. To understand what the base trends are that are driving this, I spoke with Achin Bharadwaj, Executive Director of Asset Allocation at wealth management firm Client Associates. What's happening is that a significant chunk of investors from India, particularly when we look at the ultra HNI segment, they are realizing a need for creating an asset base overseas. Now, since there is a cap of $250,000 per annum per individual, they have to accumulate funds over a period of time in order to fund the purchase of property or support their children studying overseas. As a matter of fact, you know, we have been observing an increasing number of children opting to go overseas, universities for higher education, or for that matter, investors are also keen to have a second residence overseas. So in order to be able to accumulate funds, those assets, they are accumulating and that's driving primarily this jump in the LRS remittances. So you're saying that education is the primary mover, which in turn is driving asset acquisition or creation and money going there to obviously support education or tuition fees and boarding, lodging and so on. Yeah, so that is, you know, one very significant segment. Apart from that, as I mentioned, people are keen to have a second or a third residence overseas so that they can easily spend more time when they are with their family based overseas or they are vacationing there. So that is another sort of a segment. And to add to it, there is traveling. So more people are traveling abroad, particularly after COVID. So it's a confluence of these several factors which is actually leading to this. But motivation for creating an asset base overseas, that is primarily driven by the next generation. So to educate them and to settle them abroad. Right. So I guess that sort of balances out my next question. So Indian markets have also been strong in this period. And for those, I guess, who are looking to just allocate assets more efficiently, how are people looking You know, between Indian and international? Yeah, that is a very interesting aspect. See, what's happening is that of late, we have observed that the Indian markets have performed relatively better than most other markets. But, you know, when we actually look at investing from a long-term standpoint, there is a strong merit in achieving diversification. There is a strong merit in actually participating in some of the investment teams, which could be absent in the Indian markets. I would just reconnect, you know, say something like a climate change or a few other themes, which are more predominant representation you will find in offshore markets, which are altogether missing in India. And what we have also observed is that there has been a negative correlation between India and some of the other global markets. So from a portfolio diversification standpoint, also it makes sense to diversify, even though, you know, temporarily Indian markets could be outperforming. And when it comes to international investing, it's not that we are putting a very large chunk of your investments, but possibly around 10 to 15% of the portfolio, overall portfolio, could be allocated to the international markets. Right. And how are you looking or seeing the next three quarters, Achin? Also, we are going to have a TCS of a higher tax collected at source that will kick in. Could that maybe bring down outward flows? Yeah, so that has been a temporary setback for sure. It has more of a sentimental factor. So, of course, you know, that has played its part. But I think the matured investors realize that, you know, at the end of it, it is something that gets reimbursed. It's a procedural hassle one has to live with. But in order to fulfill the requirement for funding offshore expenses and creating an asset base overseas, there is a sort of you know, no shortcut to that. So I think, yes, it's a temporary setback, but I sense that investors will overcome this and will continue to remit. Chin, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It was a pleasure talking to you, Govind. While outflows are increasing, inflows are decreasing. In this case, foreign direct investment. A.K. Bhattacharya, columnist in the Business Standard, has pointed out that there is a disconcerting trend in the pace of FDI investments into the country. For the first time since 2012-13, or about 10 years, gross foreign direct investment in 22-23 declined by 16% to $71 billion. 
This, he says, has continued into the first quarter of the current financial year, that's 2024, with FDI falling another 22% to $18 billion. Foreign equity investments, which of course have a different ebb and flow, have also fallen in the last and same quarter by 33%. Adverse economic conditions have affected not just India's export of merchandise goods, but also FDI or foreign direct investment inflows, he points out. Meanwhile, in China, global investors have been shedding China's blue chip stocks during the longest stretch of outflows on record, Bloomberg News is reporting. Overseas funds have been fleeing the mainland market, that's mainland China, offloading the equivalent of about $11 billion in a 13-day run of withdrawals through Wednesday, the longest since Bloomberg says it began tracking the data in 2016. What's also interesting is that one of the largest foreign investor holding and sale was of China's largest liquor maker, Kwai Chao Moutai Co., which was the most heavily sold stock via trading links with Hong Kong. Foreign investors sold $851 million of the liquor major stock. This was followed by selling in leading renewable stock Longyi Green Energy and lender China Merchants Bank, according to the latest data on individual stock available on Bloomberg. Back home, the power ministry has directed imported coal-based power units, that's imported coal and not power units, to run at full capacity further till October in the backdrop of record electricity demand in August, the Economic Times is reporting. The ministry had in February directed the imported coal-based plants to run optimally till June 15th, starting March 16th, under Section 11 of the Electricity Act in anticipation of higher demand in summer. It was then extended till September end and now, of course, extended further. Electricity demand in India has now touched a record high this month, touching 234 gigawatts as of August 17th. In contrast, May, which is peak summer all over the country, recorded a maximum demand of 221.7 gigawatt or about 222 gigawatt. While in June, also peak summer, it touched 223 gigawatts. June, of course, also sees the onset of monsoons in many parts of the country, which was delayed this year. The unexpected demand has been attributed to a rise in irrigation needs in some parts of the country and humid weather. Lower wind power generation has also put some pressure on thermal capacities, sources told the Economic Times. And before I go, the good news, India's Chandrayaan-3 has made a successful landing on the moon's south pole. The Chandrayaan-3 mission was launched on July 14th from Sri Harikota. The mission's objectives of Chandrayaan-3 were to demonstrate a safe and soft landing on the lunar surface and to demonstrate the rover roving on the moon and to conduct in situ or on-rover scientific experiments. That's it from me for today. Have a great day ahead and see you tomorrow. Do write in to us with what you would like us to do and a special thanks to many of you who have been writing in with your feedback. This was The Core Report with me, Govindraj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at The Core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter at www.thecore.in. That is www.thecore.in. Or follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter and Facebook as well. Now, we would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant to you including our reporting on India's vibrant manufacturing sector. Write to us at feedback at the core.in. Thank you for listening.